Please take a moment to uh, silence your cell phones. I'd like to remind you that no flash uh, photography is permitted during tonight's event. Following the event, a book signing will take place upstairs in the lobby. And don't forget that most of our author events are also offered as podcasts at freelibrary.org. Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. I'm uh, Representative Jim Roebuck, and uh, I'm certainly very happy to be here this evening. I'm a, a native Philadelphian. I grew up in Philadelphia, graduated from Central High School. Uh, but my particular, in <laughs> my particular focus tonight is on the fact that I went to first college at uh, Virginia Union University in Richmond, from which I received a uh, history degree of honors, and then I did my master's and PhD at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville. So I'm a wahoo, as they say. Uh, subsequent to that, I uh, taught history at Drexel University for more years than I like to think about. <laughs> Putting all the right, right points here. I worked briefly in the mayor's office as a legislative assistant to Mayor Wilson Good, and in, the, in 1985 was elected to the state legislature where I still serve, and am currently the minority or Democratic chair of the House Education Committee. The Free Library is dedicated to advancing literacy guiding learning and inspiring curiosity. From its award-winning author event series to its thought-provoking programs like the upcoming American Presidential Series, which will present compelling programs through the presidential election season. It's now my pleasure and indeed honor to introduce the preeminent scholars Annette Gordon-Reed and Peter Onuf who will uh, be uh, the uh, presenters for this evening. Annette Gordon-Reed is a professor at Harvard, both in its university and its law school. Received the 2008 National Book Award and the 2009 Pulitzer Prize in History for the Hemings of Monticello. Her other multitudes of honors include the National Humanities Medal, a Guggenheim Fellowship in the Humanities and a MacArthur Genius Fellowship. Peter Ornoff is one of America's leading Jefferson, Jefferson scholars, serving as Thomas Jefferson Memorial Foundation Professor Emeritus at the University of Virginia and the Senior Research, research Historian at the Robert H. Smith Institutional Center for Jefferson, Jefferson Studies. His books include the Mind of Thomas Jefferson and Jefferson's Empire. In their new book, Most Blessed of Patriots, Thomas Jefferson and the Empire of Imagination, Ms. Gordon Reed and Mr. Onoff present revealing, a revealing character study of the man from Monticello who we thought we knew. Presidential historian John Meckham praises uh, and I quote, with characteristic uh, uh, insight and intellectual rigor, Annette Gordon-Reed and Peter Onoff have produced a powerful and lasting portrait of the mind of Thomas Jefferson. This is an essential and brilliant book by two of the nation's foremost scholars, a book that will, like its protagonists, endure. We are so pleased to have them here with us this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Annette Gordon-Reed and Peter Onoff to the Free Library. Thank you very much, it's wonderful to be here and to be here with one of my very best friends, Annette Gordon-Reed. And uh, we'd just like to start by talking a little bit about uh, our authorial friendship. The secret is, I wouldn't have done this book uh, if it 
hadn't been for Annette inviting me and then an opportunity to spend time with her. So that's what a serious scholar I am. <laughs> <laughs> Annette, maybe you could make a better argument for the. <laughs> well, people ask us how we came to do this and when this book began, the idea for doing it. And I say that it began sometime at the end of the 1990s when I had written a manuscript about Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings in American Controversy. It looked at the way historians had treated the story of Jefferson and Hemings. And I wanted to find people who had been skeptical or who, people who I thought would be skeptical of the story because I think it's always better to have people who are going to tell you what you do wrong as opposed to people who are going to just agree with you about whatever it is you're saying. So I... I really let her down. You let her down. Well, <laughs> you know, he, I called him up and I said, you know, I have this manuscript that, I'm, that I've worked on. I called him because he was the Thomas Jefferson then Memorial Foundation professor at UVA. He was the successor to Merrill Peterson and the successor to Duma Malone. And so I figured that he would be hostile to what it was that I was saying. And I wanted to hear what he had to say. And he agreed to look at the, the manuscript and he read it. And to my surprise, he liked it. And he actually not only liked it, he wanted the University Press of Virginia, that's what it was called and now it's the University of Virginia Press, to publish the book. And I'd had an offer from another trade publisher and I decided that I wanted to go with Virginia because it was Jefferson's University and it's an academic press. And because of the nature of what I was doing, I thought that it would be better to have um, academics know that this was a book that had been vetted by other academics. Usually when you submit a, big, a book to an academic press, at least two, sometimes three scholars are asked to review it before they decide to publish it. So I felt it was better to go with Virginia, and I did. And ever since then, we've been really good friends. We've been on this journey together. Uh, Peter has been writing about Jefferson from the standpoint of, of uh, he's an intellectual historian. So he writes about Jefferson's writings, what Jefferson read, and how it affected, influenced his life. I, and he writes about politics as well. I am more a social historian. I do uh, write about Jefferson and slavery. Uh, his private life, some of the politics as well. So this was an opportunity for two people who've been looking at a person from a different perspective to come together and see what we could, what we could say about Jefferson that might be new. Well, until Jefferson came into my life, I didn't write about people. I mean, I really love people, real people, but dead people don't interest me particularly. <laughs> I'm interested in ideas. Uh, and uh, Jefferson, because I came to Virginia out of self-defense, I had to work on Jefferson. And uh, Annette, of course, uh, she's all about people. She's a social historian. And it was a thrill for me as an old guy to find out that I could do the kind of history that we were doing together. The common ground we have is we're trying to figure this guy out. And we start with the premise that you can figure him out. He didn't want us to understand him. And now you are the first readers in world history to understand Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the other thing, the impetus for it, I should say, is that we had been having these conversations about Jefferson all these years. And as he alluded to just then, there's this notion that he's this inscrutable person, that he's so contradictory, so mysterious, um, that he can't be figured out. And as he said, yeah. we think we can figure him out to the extent that you can figure any human being out who's not yourself. Sometimes we can't figure ourselves out. So we're all very complicated people, and that the best approach was to look at him as a human being, to sort of, as we say in the book, when it is at all reasonable, to take him at his word, and that, with that caveat, when it's all reasonable, to take him at his word when he says that what his intentions are, what he believes, what he thinks is going to happen. We sort of have come to the conclusion that Jefferson scholarship had sort of the Jefferson personal life and his understanding about him as a man had sort of run into a ditch, uh, sort of exemplified by one word, hypocrisy. I mean, every even even the sort of headlines That's about the That's the book, last time that word will be mentioned. The last time the word is, <laughs> you know, even the, the you know, headlines for writing about the book, a book in which we say that hypocrisy is not the proper lens through which to view Jefferson, use the word hypocrisy because it's, it's so common. It rolls off people's tongues when thinking about him without thinking about the hypocrisy of other members of the founding generation. He sort of cornered the market on that. And it's sort of a way for people to sort of show that they know something about him by saying hypocrite. 
and that sort of gets you two-thirds of the way. We wanted to move beyond that and say, you know, look, there's much more to writing about him and thinking about him than this sort of, you know, trope of hypocrisy as the thing that defines yeah. him. I think the first clue on Jefferson is that he erected a wall around himself. You've heard of this wall of separation between church and state. We think that that metaphor applies to Jefferson and the rest of the world. He insisted on his privacy in his sanctum sanctorum in his house. He would be all alone and nobody would penetrate that space. But that very insistence on the distinction between private and public, between his life within his family, among his friends, with his slaves, and his life as a statesman and a leader, his insistence that you, they are distinct domains is the first clue in understanding him. Why does he insist so much on this? And this is where I think we get to the title of the book because the key word, you'll get it right there in the title, and you can tell this book by its title, <laughs> uh, not because of the beautiful art, the picture of Jefferson, but because of that one word, the patriarch. So uh, help these people because this is an astonishing concept. <laughs> this will be therapy. This is an astonishing <laughs> idea that the great icon of democracy the man who wrote the words that then led to the creation of this necktie that I'm now wearing. It is the decoration <laughs> on his necktie. Right, right. I, I do do this audiovisual kind of stuff. Uh, <laughs> that he could call himself a patriarch, which has a sort of a ring of the archaic, the pre-democratic, you might even say the anti-democratic. Absolutely, he uses the phrase in a letter that he writes to Angelica Church, uh, Angelica Schuyler Church, if people have seen the play Hamilton, it's the woman that is one of the Schuyler sisters, you know, who's looking for a mind at work, uh, she says in the song. Uh, Jefferson and she knew each other, met each other when he was in France, and they had something of a flirtation. People mainly think of Jefferson in relationship to Mariah Cosway uh, when he's in France, but. Angelica Church was another married woman with whom he flirted and had a sort of highly charged relationship. And in 1793, he writes to her at the end of his tenure as Secretary of State in Washington's cabinet. He's been sort of beaten up by Alexander Hamilton, um, Angelica's uh, brother-in-law, who you know, he had sort of in competition with Hamilton for the favor of George Washington. Um, he, Hamilton wins this battle and Jefferson is going home. And he writes to her and says, you know, he doesn't mention the sort of wars with Hamilton, but he knows. But she knew all she, she knew all about, about this course. stuff because they were very, very close. Right. Um, so he writes to her and says, you know, I'm going back to Monticello. And one of the lines is he talks about having to go home to his fields and his farm and his books and to, you know, to watch for the happiness of those who labor for mine. In other words, the enslaved people on his plantation. You know, he talks about his daughters, and he says, if they come live ne next to me and they're married off and do well, then I will be the most blessed of the, of, of the patriarchs. And he, I will count myself as blessed as the most blessed of the patriarchs. And as Peter said, mm -hmm. that's sort of a strange word to use uh, to describe a person who saw himself as a Republican with a small r, you know, Democratic Republican, uh, a champion of the common man, a person who believed in the power of people of the people, of the common people. Um, a patriarch is an autocrat. A patriarch is someone who rules over his domain, his family, sometimes enslaved people. You think about ancient times. In another letter, he describes himself as living like an antediluvian patriarch among his you know, farm and his family and so forth. So what we wanted to do is to think, how can these things exist together? Now, we see this as a, con as a contradiction but it made sense to Jefferson. Oh, it's much more than a contradiction. Think of Jefferson's association with rights. He's the president who defines the rights. He's the one who articulates natural rights. Well, one of the rights that seems most natural to him is to have complete control over his domestic domain. If anybody else is exercising influence in his household economy and the little society of his mountaintop plantation, then he's, his control would be subverted, his dominion would be subverted. 
And if he is not secure in his dominion, then he can't be truly independent. That word independence is resonant both for the country as a whole and for Thomas Jefferson and other American men. They're independent so that they can form a government based on consent with each other. We make the further move that the people and the family should be equal too. And that's what he says all men, and he means including women, are equal in some fundamental human sense, but the family unit itself is natural. And that's the key to understanding this link that we're exploring between the private and the public. The family isn't just a refuge, a way to get away from Alexander Hamilton. You can understand that. <laughs> Jefferson says he hates politics, but he's lying. See, we do call him out occasionally. That's not hypocrisy. Everybody has to say that. And you have to say it particularly in the revolutionary period, in the founding period, because if you were in politics for the sake of power and self-aggrandizement, you'd be the enemy of democracy. We're not supposed to have political parties. People don't run for office, they stand. You understand the distinction? You're standing for office means you're an upright man, you're standing, people see you, and they say, we want you to represent us. So we think that as we began to explore that connection between how Jefferson lives and what he thinks, that both dimensions of his life become clearer to us. Well, and family is natural, as you say, and the sort of, sort of natural order in the family with the male as the head of the family. Used to be natural. Well, new <laughs> used his understanding of natural. <laughs> Jefferson's born in 1743, I will remind you, understanding of what natural was with the man as the patriarch, as the head of the family, right. and who, over whom he exercised power, but also had a, for right. whom he had responsibility. So there's this notion of that Jefferson has of himself as something that we think is problematic, a benevolent patriarch, a benevolent figure, and that's how he thought people were supposed to rule in the family. And the family being the basic unit of the community, of the, of the nation, you start with the family, and you radiate it out to the community at large, locally, and then on up to the natural, national government, that the government itself was sort of a model of families which causes, you know, it made sense to him, but it gave him a particular view about who could be in the nation, who could right, be a right. part of the people, and that's what led him to believe that there should be an end to slavery, but African Americans had to find their own country because he did not believe that there could be a conflict-free, multiracial, the way we say we aspire to a multiracial society, with blacks and whites living together. Whites would never give up their prejudices against blacks. Blacks would never forgive whites for what they had done. There's no way he could not at that time argue for intermixture and said that that was not something, that was not a plan that could be adopted. So what had to happen is that African Americans, you know, black people would find their own country. They did not come to the country voluntarily. They were brought here in right. chains they would have to find their place so that they could have their own country and, would full, and have their own full rights. Jefferson could not have conceived of a society where there were large numbers of people who were second-class citizens. Republican nation would have to have yeah. first-class citizenship for everybody. It's not the kind of world that we, we had after the Civil War, where laws were passed where blacks were, and even were, when laws weren't passed, where blacks were treated as second-class citizens. And there's a question, you had to fight for citizenship. It's really right, funny to right. think about Jefferson and Malcolm X. But Malcolm X <laughs> said, you know, he's, he, he's sort of chiding uh, King and other civil rights demonstrators saying, why do you have to fight for your freedom? If you are a citizen of a country, why should you have to fight for freedom? That, that's telling you something there if you have to do it. So we, contem we condemn Jefferson a lot, or people condemn Jefferson a great deal for that statement, but it's the truth. We have had sort of conflict and serious conflict among the races since from the very, very beginning. This is not to say that we're, we can't overcome them, but it's, I've always thought it's a bit naive to suggest that he was not he was being crazy when he suggested that that was a possibility when you look at history and see what has happened. And it's very easy to moralize about Jefferson. 
and very easy to use that word hypocrisy because for us, the morally compelling issue of the founding era was the definition of the American people and for us that it did not include all of us then is very disturbing. But the best way to understand it is not to start wagging our finger and condemning Jefferson as if he falls short of a standard he should have had. The best way to get at Jefferson's slavery is to work through his mind. And I think this is one of the ways that we developed our complementarity. Annette has beautifully t retold the story, or told for the first time, the story of some of the people who lived at Monticello. And that's a story that we need to hear, and it's very compelling to us. What was Jefferson thinking? And here, it's important to bring up what might seem like an old, boring story to you, and that is Jefferson and his fellow revolutionaries thought they were changing the world by attacking monarchy, aristocracy, privilege, established churches, all these forms of inequality and second-class citizenship that Annette was talking about. They were struggling against the tyranny of George III, they were killing the king. His rule had become unnatural because he was making war on his own subjects. People who, in America, revered him until the imperial crisis that led to independence. In other words, King George was a bad father. And we get back to the notion of fatherhood. And a simple way to understand what mobilized a lot of men, the very independent men of Virginia who thought well of themselves and still do in the first families, <laughs> is to think of George III as somebody who challenged their own patri patriarchy, their fatherhood on their plantations and in their families. Their fatherhood was incompatible with the wicked fatherhood of George III. This is all about men and we have to understand this because for Jefferson, the difference in gender, which we take to be a social construction is the fashionable way to put it because we're all basically alike. We keep discovering that we're not. It's very upsetting to me. <laughs> we don't think that this difference should really matter very much and we're struggling with it. For Jefferson, it's nature. Mm -hmm. It's supposed to be like this. And in the same way, I think, we can think about race in this way. Because think of the idea of race it really means the same thing as people. It means the same thing as nation. Thomas Jefferson and his colleagues were nation builders. It was on the basis of, of these natural connections among Republican families who came together to govern themselves because they had rejected the governance of a bad father, of a bad king. And this is the ugly side that we are contemplating, and that is families who come together in a democracy are held together by bonds of love. But what is the boundary of that great family of families? It's those people who are not part of your family, who are not here in America voluntarily, who are a captive nation in chains. How would you solve that problem? How would you do justice to the enslaved people held against their will and working for you. You don't have to agree with Jefferson, and we don't, in his solution that Annette was talking about. Emancipation and expatriation, a country of your own. But at least the beginning of understanding is to see where it comes from. And it comes from these ideas about what is natural, and that's another way of saying what is right, what is moral. And it's confusing, doubly confusing, because we think of the enlightenment, the, even the word, as inevitably positive. You're enlightened, you learn things, but the dark side of the enlightenment was this sort of racial hierarchy. Right. Classifications, the tendency to put everything in a place, the New a Newtonian system of the way mm -hmm. the world works. Boy, I sort of, this is sort of an off thought, but I wonder what he would make of particle physics. <laughs> if you could explain to him, you know, at the Newton level, uh, the world works this way, but in this microscopic level, all the things that you think are right and natural don't oh, no, apply please. at all. Okay, I'm not, okay, I'm <laughs> not, I won't go off into that, I won't go off into that. But um, the Enlightenment fires Jefferson's imagination, right, and right. he wants desperately, the thing that's clear, and I hope it comes through in the book, 
wants desperately to be seen as a progressive person. And the funny thing about it is that now he's seen as this sort of reactionary right. conservative person. During his lifetime, he was seen as this wild-eyed revolutionary. Right. Uh, there were people in South Carolina, you know, South Carolina, who thought, <laughs> don't <laughs> laugh at that, I didn't mean that, but who thought that he was gonna lead a slave revolt. I mean, you know, it's just craziness. Uh, but the, uh, the image that he had at the time was of somebody who was far out there, um, largely because of his, in part because of his religious views, of his, the things that he said about slavery. Um, uh, he was very, very afraid of how people were gonna react to the words in Notes in the State of Virginia where he criticizes slavery, of course, and this tells you how you just never know what people are gonna be looking at right. later in later generations are gonna look at. The part of notes on the state of Virginia when he says the disparaging things about black people, that's what we fixate on. And he would, and those are not throwaway lines for him, but that's not the core of what he's talking about. He's making these grand pronouncements about the evils of slavery, and he's concerned that, that his fellow yeah. Virginians, whom he's tested right. out by trying to, you know, when he is a young man, uh, wants to have an emancipation, uh, to introduce a, a legislation emancipating slaves, and they totally reject it. In 1796, later on, St. George Tucker does a similar thing and they totally reject it. He knows that Virginians are not gonna, there's not gonna be a Republican solution to the end of slavery. In other words, they're not gonna vote it out. And so he sort of gives up on all of that right. for these people. There is a pathos to this and we can sympathize with Jefferson because the standard he held was that it takes an enlightened people to do the right thing but this new form of self-government will enable people to see the light. And as they see that light, they'll act against slavery. It won't happen now, maybe the next generation. It may take several generations. But this is where I think a nice point to turn toward Jefferson's religion because this is a prayerful attitude. He prays that his children and children's children will see the light and do the right thing about slavery. And the pathos of it is it gets harder and harder and harder to do the right thing because slaves are worth too much. They're too valuable. Just check the price of slaves. If Jefferson could actually understand his own portfolio, to use a modern term, he'd see that his Which enslaved he didn't, people. But that's no, no, that's sorry. another thing about Jefferson. That was his capital. That, that was whatever legacy he left to his children. And he had hoped and thought, and many Enlightenment thinkers did, that slavery was an archaic form and it would disappear as if by, well, the kind of magic that brought the light to the Enlightenment. Because after all, free labor is more productive, isn't it? Because if people have incentives, if they're using their body to serve the interests of the people they love, their labor goes towards some good that they can recognize their own families. It's not true, unfortunately, and this is one of the things that I think is important to know when we talk about Jefferson and slavery, and it's a big discovery over the last couple of generations among historians of slavery. It's an enormously profitable institution. The fact that Thomas Jefferson never became an apologist for slavery never said slavery was a positive good, is itself a remarkable thing because it was so easy to move in that direction, well, that direction of rationalization. Well, that's the thing that sort of we, we also say in the book that if he had said that, if he just said, you know, like the generation that comes after him, that slavery is not, you know, a necessary evil, that the generation after him says it's not a necessary evil, in fact, it's a positive good, mm -hmm. he'd be understandable. Because you could say, you know, he was no hypocrisy about this. there. No hypocrisy there. It's good. The African race was meant to be enslaved, and we're enslaving them. And isn't it great? I mean, that he would be consistent in that point. The difficulty here is that this is a person who, for whatever reason, well, not whatever reason, because he thought that there were certain things, uh, certain right. precepts of the Enlightenment. Science would get better. Um, the world would get better. He sort of believed that people were basically good and that they could be trained to become better. He believed those things, and it's very difficult for us, I think, in our, in our more, much more cynical age to actually take that seriously, but we're convinced that, that he did believe these things. Yeah. You know, and you know, people ask us and on this point of religion, um, 
was there anything that Peter and I disagreed about? Uh, because we, it seems here that we're sort of on the same page about everything. We were not on the same page initially about Jefferson and religion. Now, I grew up in the United Methodist tradition, um, and when Jefferson calls himself a Christian, I sort of think that he's saying that, you know, sort of always assume that he was saying that just to, if not curry favor, but to sort of cover himself so, or so protect you himself. You don't think Unitarians are Christians, do you? <laughs> no, no, we Let just have to work this out. Let me finish the story. Let me finish the story. <laughs> Let me finish the story. I said I had difficulty with that with a person who said he didn't believe in, you know, the divinity of Christ. He didn't believe in the miracles. He didn't believe in the Trinity. Now, however, I'm not talking about my personal belief, but I'm just talking about my understanding of what Christianity is from my training and from the way I was raised. And I was sort of doubtful, I was sort of dismissive of Jefferson in that. And I was about to say that <laughs> arguing with Peter, who is from a Unitarian tradition. If you can uh, call it a tradition. A tradition, <laughs> whatever that is, a Unitarian tradition convinced me that I was being prejudiced, that I was being too dogmatic. <laughs> Like yes, this, that's the word for the it. Dogmatic, the exact word I for love it. this confession. Confessional it's moment. Very, it's good for it. It's good for it, yeah, <laughs> something like that. But that I was not taking Jefferson's religion, his statement that he was a Christian, seriously. Because, and if you think about it, I mean, there, was, there have certainly been, there, there was a council, people talked about what gospel, uh, gospels would go in, what gospels would come out, it would not go in or whatever. So it's not like there was some received tradition that came down unchallenged through the ages, and so I backed up away from that, and I became convinced that he does, you know, he can't call himself a Christian, that he was sincere, I would say, in right. his belief that he was a Christian. And one of the things he says is that he wanted to hear the voice of Jesus as a great ethical teacher who could speak to mankind, the family of mankind, without the intermediation of all the interpreters all the priests, all the people who had a self-interest in interpreting him in a certain way. A miracle is, simply speaking, a violation of the law of nature. And then you're saying that God is not lawful and creation doesn't make sense. But isn't understanding, trying to understand the laws that govern God's creation a way of worshiping God? This is the deist position, which is easy, easily trivialized and rejected today because it doesn't involve, we think, a leap of faith. I think that's wrong. To believe in an orderly world, to believe in the imminent light and enlightenment of the world, and the possibility that Jesus' gospel of peace and love could become universal and that all peoples in the world would participate in that. You couldn't believe what was going to happen soon. It had to be something you could only pray for. It wouldn't happen in your lifetime. And it's that awesome faith in creation, I think, that deserves more respect than it has gotten from people who assume that their embrace of some miracle mysticism teaching that is special to them because of their personal relationship to a godlike Christ this is Jefferson's insistence, and this is, I'll throw this out to you Calvinists. There must be one out there or two. <laughs> <laughs> Jefferson said this, I'm the real Christian. John Calvin, you, wherever you are in the audience, <laughs> you are an atheist. And he believed that. And so in thinking that there would be religion, he sort of knew that religion would be a part of American life forever. Right. So he takes uh, a razor blade <laughs> and cuts up the Bible uh, removing all the miracles, all of the things that he thought violated the laws of the rules of science that kind of kept Ju Jesus' pure teachings, you know, intact. And he wanted this to be a part of sort of like a civic religion for the new Republican society. So, and in fact, for a time, what was called the Jefferson Bible, he named it uh, the life and morals of Jesus of Nazareth, not Jesus Christ, but Jesus of Nazareth was given out to members of the House of Representatives uh, when they were elected. Can you imagine? Published by the government. Because something like that could happen, if you could imagine that something like that could happen. never happen Texas. <laughs> <laughs> See, now you're picking on everything here. My, I, my I home wasn't going to tell anybody you're from Texas. Yeah, well, you know. But I mean, so he, 
thought that that kind of book would be a good book for the new right. Republican society. Religion was supposed to be important, but the ethical teachings of, of Jesus, not the miracles and not the other things that he thought would be, in, had to be interpreted by people who, you know, or explained by people who had ulterior right. motives. People who were right. connected to this notion of the monarchy were always somehow connected to kings together. So all of this is Jefferson, you know, like we had in the, in the Cold War, um, you know, the, the communist menace or whatever, or, you know, a, a country, you know, some sort of system that we think is opposed to us. For him, his system was monarchy, and when he talks about priestcraft, it's not just people who are religious teachers, right. but people who are hooked up with this monarchical form of government that held down the common people, did not allow people to participate in government. And he was looking toward a future day when, and now is the time for you Unitarians to declare yourself, every young man in America would be a Unitarian. He's a visionary. He sees far <laughs> into the future. <laughs> and <did> way, way <laughs> off But what he's seen, I think this is important. It comes back to one of our big themes. His spiritual quest is all about making sense of history, and the course of history through time. And for him, people who are no longer constrained to worship in state-supported churches but freely choose what preaching to hear, they will become increasingly enlightened. And through the competition of the religious marketplace that separation of church and state makes possible, what will emerge eventually will be a genuinely democratic religion of the people that will shape their moral and ethical vision. We said before, if you have self-government, then an enlightened people will do the right thing. Jefferson didn't think it was enough just to let people as they were make these momentous decisions. They needed to be educated, enlightened. They needed to be taught. And a truly Christian, enlightened Christianity would do that for the American people. I would risk saying that Jefferson advocated the emergence of a Christian nation. Now don't start pushing back at me because that's a term that is used on a very anti-Jeffersonian position on the far right. He also believed that in nature and, it, and the creation of nature's God, there was an intelligent design. It made sense. And this was his quest to make sense of the world in the face of his own ignorance, his darkness, of all the things he didn't know, all the things he couldn't predict, but he prayed for the light. Mm -hmm. So I think with that, we're supposed to take questions from you guys. This is a revival meeting. We just wanted you to know that. <laughs> just wanted you to know that. He's going to be taking the... He's our man. Hi. Yeah, raise your hand and we'll get a microphone to you. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, provocative, interesting presentation. Could you say a word about uh, both Jefferson's mentor, Mr. Wyeth, and also what role, if any, did the Henry Adams work have in your understanding of this ethereal empire of the imagination? Ooh. Well, we, we, we quote Henry Adams at the beginning because he creates the, the lines that people use about seeing the semi-transparent shadows that sort of suggest that Jefferson is this, you know, inscrutable individual. It's had a lot of influence. Henry Adams was a masterful writer and... And, and, and he was an Adams. And he was an Adams, <laughs> and his family had long had sort of ambivalent <laughs> relations uh, with, with Jefferson. So it's been enormously influential. George Wythe was Jefferson's teacher, law teacher. He studied law with him longer than most people studied law, maybe almost five years. He said he was his ancient master, his dear friend. This is when, when, when Wythe is, is murdered uh, later on. Uh, he was of incalculable importance uh, to Jefferson as a mentor. And he was anti-slavery. He too was a figure of enlightenment. We talk about Williamsburg and Jefferson being there and suggesting that his relations with with, uh, with with and others, the governor, that these people were his his teachers. They sort of set him on a path. And he would say to himself, you know, if he, he told his grandson later on, because he thought that, that you know, young people, until they got to be a, a certain age, were not really fit for making their own decisions, that what you should do is model yourself after other, you know, eminent 
people, eminent men, and Wythe was one of the people that he suggests. He'd ask himself, you know, if he, you know, if he was in a difficult situation, he'd say, what would Mr. Wythe do uh, as an answer? You, you might say that the mentor for Jefferson was a culture hero. It's his model of the relationship between the generations, of passing on the wisdom and the light. Uh, that's why he's the professor's favorite founder, because <laughs> he's one of us. <laughs> Playing off the idea of culture hero, can you both address his fascination and um, his fascination with and the importance of music to him, which you address in the book? Yeah, we have a chapter on music instead of the sort of this is not a, it's not a typical you know soup to nuts biography of Jefferson. There are certain themes, and we and have he gets nuts different late chapters. In life, and he starts with no. Sorry. Oh, please stop it. <laughs> <laughs> the three sections: patriarch that sets up his life, and then the second one is traveler when he you know goes mm -hmm. overseas, and the last one is called enthusiast. And the chap and music is the first chapter in there. He said music was the favorite passion of his soul. He played the violin. There's some evidence that he might have played the cello, but he sang. He liked to sing for people, um, and he sang when he was by himself. Um, Edmund Bacon and Isaac, uh, Je Isaac uh, Granger was his real last name. He's called Isaac Jefferson, an enslaved man at Monticello, said that he was always singing. When he was riding along, he was singing. Um, and his granddaughter remembers him singing all the time. His wife, uh, Martha, was an excellent harpsichordist, and she sang, and uh, that was a part of family. It's sort of making families Music was an integral part of all of that, singing together, playing music together with his daughters. Um, his younger daughter, um, Mariah, was not so great, uh, not as enthusiastic a musician, but you know she tried uh, to, to please him. Uh, and all of his children with, I mean, the sons with Sally Hemings were violinists. Eston, the youngest one, actually made his living as, as, a, as a musician, a violinist in, violinist in Ohio. And his signature tune was one of Jefferson's favorite tunes, a tune called Money Musk, and that was what he was known for playing. So music, he thought, attached you to people. It was a sentiment. Yeah, very this, important. In, in very important, a way to, to have sort of a meaning of the minds and more the meetings of the heart. Uh, it was very emotional to him. So this person who's seen as uh, some can be described sometimes as a distant, chilly person, but he was he more or less more shy, I would say, because people said after a while he warmed up. But music was the way of making connections to people. It's the model of an ideal conversation that everybody brings something to it, but you have to be well trained mm -hmm. and you have to play together. It's a vision of democracy. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's completely unrealistic, but it's something that he and his family could practice in his home and that he could imagine for the American people. Mm -hmm. Uh, think of American history as uh, a really good extended jazz riff. Uh, for Jefferson, it would be harmony, it would be civil, it wouldn't be rancorous or conflictual, there wouldn't be dueling solos, Hamilton versus Jefferson. It would be one great beautiful song. So even in his leisure time activities, He's performing and acting and thinking about what matters most to him, both in his family and in society as a whole. Mm -hmm. So Jefferson wrote the American Songbook. <laughs> we will uh, we'll try to stack people up here. Uh, Lonnie in front, and then there's a gentleman in a black hat halfway back. What do you think Jefferson would think about our freedoms of today? Now, I mean not only freedoms uh, from monarchy, freedoms right. for slaves, but also freedoms for women. Mm -hmm. Women actually did not get the vote until 50 years after male right. slaves got the vote. Right. Mm -hmm. What do you think he would think about today? <laughs> she says that with a smile on her face. <coughs> you want to start with well, that? Well, do I want to start with that? I think, I think that the emancipation of women would be more difficult for him than what has happened on the racial front. I think women. It's not natural. It's not natural. <laughs> it's not nat. I mean, I think, you know, it, he says, I venture it as a suspicion only that blacks are intellectually inferior to whites. Of course, he believed that, and most of the people of his time believe that, and many people believe that today. But he would never have ventured it as a suspicion that women you know, were different than me. It, that would have been 
clear as the bedrock principle. So I think someone asked me when I was working on the Hemings of the Monticello, it came out in 2008, and people asked me, you know, would he be more upset about Barack Obama being president or Hillary Clinton being president? <laughs> And no, no, he'd be a Republican. I don't think he'd be a Republican, but I don't think there's any question that he would have been more upset about a woman president because that would have violated nature. That's, mm -hmm. that's just not, he, we would have understood that there were men in other countries who were leaders, and sometimes a woman got to be president if, or, or king or queen if something went wrong. But um, <laughs> men, he understood that men, he talks about, when he talks about slave, enslaved people revolting and, and you know, rising up against their masters. He's talking about men. Women aren't in the picture. They're not an object of fear for him. I would just qualify that, and I, I hesitate to quarrel once again with Annette because I get in real trouble, and we're going to be on the road for a while. Uh, <laughs> but the qualification I would make is this, and I'm serious now. Jefferson's notion of democracy isn't that we are all capable now, as you find us, to govern ourselves intelligently. He thinks you have to work for it. He thinks, uh, and the letter that gets uh, people really upset that he writes to his uh, daughter Martha Patsy when she's 12 years old about how she can please him. If you do this, I will love you. And anybody who's been raised on, uh, on uh, Fred Rogers <laughs> and been in his neighborhood, and I think most of you did that to your children, it didn't happen to you. Uh, of course, Mr. Rogers, a good Presbyterian preacher, loves you just the way you are. Jefferson doesn't, and it's not that he doesn't love his daughters, but he wants them, as the Marines want you to be, all that you can be. Now, that was a, a, a misapplication of something, but the, the, the point is serious. And, and uh, what do you think about this? That uh, show me, uh, and with female well, education, for instance, with his granddaughters and their ability to learn the classic well, link. I, I'm going to push back a bit. What? Come on. No, I want to push back a bit. I mean, the letter that he writes to Patsy when she's 12, he's, he's a, a, a middle-aged guy who's lost his wife. He has two daughters. He has no idea what to say to them. He's not, I mean, he's lost the, the separate spheres of male and mm -hmm. female. He's at a loss of what to do. He gradually, over time, by the time mm -hmm. he gets granddaughters, he knows what to say. He knows how to talk to, to young women. He well, knows how to exhort people. Him. I'm not. A, I'm not saying you're attacking no. him. I'm saying, I'm qualifying. Serious. I'm qualifying <laughs> this notion about, you know, what he's. He thinks he's being the dutiful, dutiful father in, in all of that. Right. And you're right. I mean, he do, He is somewhat didactic, but I, I think it comes from a place of, a panic, perhaps. Oh, I think of that's not right. understanding. I would never argue with panic. That. You know, how how am I going to do this? I, they don't have a mother. I am now in control of this, and so what do I do? But even the idea of a separate we nation let, of Africa. Oh, we should sorry, let someone else ask them, the question. We could go on. We okay. argue all the time. I, oh, there's a fellow with a mic already, and then there's a man in a black hat behind him. Um, uh, you paint Jefferson as such an idealist at all times. He's always willing to accept the best and the potential of everything. Was there ever a moment in his life where he gave in to absolute cynicism and he maybe lost some faith in the potential of oh, America yeah, or? Yeah. Great question. You want to start with it? Okay. Uh, I think th uh, the thing about optimism, I don't want to sound too psychoanalytic to you now. Uh, this is not Buenos Aires. But uh, what does that even mean? But go ahead. <laughs> the highest proportion of psychoanalysts per capita in the world is in Buenos Aires. Go ahead. All I'm saying <laughs> is, that, is that love and hate are very close to each other. Uh, same force or cathect, as Freud would say. Uh, and uh, optimism and pessimism only make sense together. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't be optimistic unless on the other side of it is this fear of failure, that it won't be there. I think he lived constantly with the fear of failure. I think that's one of the reasons that he engaged in what I call a spiritual quest. He was afraid it would all fall, fall apart. You'd pray too. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is, we talk about the spiritual quest after, when he's in retirement. The, the Jefferson speaking about religion at the end of his life is different from the young man who's sort of railing against priests and so forth. And that may be a natural progression in people's lives when he's sort of t looking back and taking stock mm -hmm. of all the things that have worked and all the things that haven't worked. At the end, the end is pretty bad because he ends up, I mean, he's broke. 
And for a long time, it's pretty clear that this is not going to work out. He keeps, um, you know, sort of fantasizing about, you know, ways to get out of debt. He has some sort of a development plan for, uh, for Milton. Uh, it's a town, uh, it, we think of Charlottesville as his town, but for most of his life, Milton, which is pretty much nothing now, uh, was the town. And he wanted to buy property there and develop it and do things. So he kept trying to do it, but near the end, he's, you know, it's a pretty, it's pretty clear that it's all gonna fall apart. And yeah, he was nasty in politics. I mean, did a lot of underhanded things. Don't, don't, don't worry, there's, there's a lot of nasty stuff in his life. And, okay, gentlemen, stand there's up. There's a lot of nasty and, stuff in politics. <laughs> That's it, That's uh, another that's word politics. for politics. <laughs> I, Go ahead. I, I haven't had the benefit of rock reading either of your books yet, although I intend to, to, to and nor have I had the benefit of reading any of Jefferson's uh, books, his mm -hmm. letters to John Adams right. and so forth. But I have a problem reconciling the hypocrisy of Jefferson mm. and the founding fathers as it pertains to slavery. Mm -hmm. My limited understanding, my nascent understanding of American history at this time, uh, uh, I'm led to believe that when the founding fathers in the colonies were confronted with opposing the evils of the British monarchy and the institutions that we inherited from the old world that were evil, slavery being the foremost, that to get the colonies to unite, the two colonies that were insisting on having slavery, uh, South Carolina, I believe, and Georgia, am I correct? Oh, well, no, you're wrong. Uh, slavery was legal everywhere. Well, but they it was legal everywhere. They insisted on it being. Uh, Sir, can you just get to the kernel of the question because we've got to move on to some other folks. Like I, I, I find it hard. That, you know, uh, it's I guess it's easy to say as a white person uh, that he was really being hypocritical. He inherited the institution, and it. I, my impression is he didn't like it, but he inherited. It. Well, I, I, well, I think I mean, that's fine statement, and uh, and we don't uh, we don't like the word. We told you not to say it. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, but no, I mean it's understandable. It's a difficult thing to for people to reconcile. But and we say about Jefferson, people have a set of intellectual beliefs that we don't always have the strength to live up to, uh, and. It's a glaring flaw to us because we see, we look back and see, you know, by not dealing with this in the beginning, um, or when, it, when, it, when Jefferson was living, we see what happens. But if they had tried to deal, I mean, the, the sort of standard answer is that there wouldn't have been a union. There's no question they there'd be no them. union. There would be no union if they had pressed. No, okay. no America. No. Okay. Well, that's our point. No, no, no. I, we missed. Well, then we missed the point. That's it. I mean, they they would not have come in. And people can say, well, people suggest, well, let them let them not come in, and they could go off and make their peace on their own if they wanted to be. But that's not. That isn't the way it went. People had an interest in creating a union, and they wouldn't have been able to do it if there had not been a compromise. I think it's important to remember Abraham Lincoln and the way. He turns back to Jefferson for the ideas and the principles that would justify a war for the Union and ultimately an end to slavery. I think it's a measure of our cynicism and disenchantment that we can't find that in Jefferson because we don't believe in progress. What Lincoln believed in the kind of progress he thought Jefferson and his generation had initiated, not achieved. Do we continue to tell that Lincolnian story that moves forward? Or do we turn back on all that came before and say it was a cynical joke against mankind? Take your pick. Hmm. Lady, uh, a question regarding Sally Hemings. Why do you think Jefferson did not free her? We talk about this in the book. Um, 
I give, I talk about this in other books as well, because the, our understanding is that, you know, when people in that kind of relationship, the thing you do is free the woman, you free the children, but not her. When Jefferson dies, in order to free her, he would have had to put her name in a document. He would have had to put her in the will to say, I'm freeing Sally Hemings. Everybody knew who Sally was in relationship to Jefferson. Her last name was not really given, but people wrote songs about them, told jokes about the whole business. So we'd have put her name in a will. He would have had to petition the legislature to ask to have her remain in the state because of, uh, a law in Virginia said that if you didn't get legislative permission, um, you had to be, you had to leave Virginia or you would be re-enslaved re after a year. The other thing is she was, at the time, uh, she was 50 years old. Um, you could not free an enslaved person below the age of 21 or above the age of 45 without explaining how you were going to take care of them, how they were gonna be provided for. So, Sally Hemings' name in a will, a petition to the legislature, and him saying, I'm, this is how much money I'm gonna leave her or property I'm gonna leave her for her to take care of herself, we would never have argued about this question. If he had done that, that would have been an admission that everything people had been saying was true, and he did not want to do that. I don't, the most important person in Jefferson's life was Martha Randolph, his eldest daughter. And this is just my speculation, just looking at the facts of what he would have to do, I don't believe he would humiliate her like that uh, to make that admission on his deathbed. The other thing too is, I don't think that Jefferson would have thought that it was a proper thing to free, she was actually 53, I'm sorry. Uh, 50, I don't think it would have been, he thought, he would have thought it was proper to free a 53 year old woman. A man is, you know, even if he could have, I mean he did free people who were older at the time and he did explain how they were gonna be taken care of. I don't think he wanted to admit this and I don't think he would have wanted to free a woman, a 53 year old woman. He had to free Harriet, the daughter, because any child she had, the, the two oldest children, Beverly and Harriet, Beverly's a male, go off as white people. Um, and they don't want freedom papers because they're living as white people. If they have freedom papers, people know that they're not all white and that's not what they wanted. So he has to free her because she's young and she can have children and if she has children, in Virginia, or any slave society, the children are enslaved because they followed you were what your mother was, it's the status. But Sally Hemings, for the reasons that this would be an admission, we would never have, we wouldn't be talking about him. We would not be here tonight talking about him. If he had admitted that he had lived for 38 years and had seven children with an African American enslaved woman, he would never have been up on Mount Rushmore. He would never, he would not have been president. <laughs> He would not have been, it just not possible. And he was all about, very much into this notion of legacy. Legacy, he thought he was going to live, he wanted to live through the ages. He knew that they had done something special in creating the United States of America and he wanted to be remembered for that. The white community would never have accepted him as a hero if he'd done that. Look at what's happened now. Look at what's happened now. All of the reevaluation of him, people are saying it, it's about his religion, it's about this. It's Sally. <laughs> um, that's what it is. And it would, he knew that, he was not a fool. He, understood, he knew his people. This is the thing, people say, well, whenever Jefferson says the people will not bear this, the people are not ready, he was the foremost politician of his era. He knew his people and he knew that if he admitted that, they would never have honored him. Well, unfortunately, we have hit our time limit. Um, please join me in thanking Annette Gordon-Reed and Peter Onuf.